Well, good morning, good afternoon and good evening to all of you. Welcome to this Risk Tech webinar on a LARP, When is Enough Enough? It's really good again to see so many people interested in this important risk man safety management topic. My name is Vicky Billingham and I look after Risk Tech's training education business. Before we get going, just a spot of housekeeping. I've muted everybody so that everyone will, should be able to hear the presentation. If you'd like to ask questions, please do this via the instant message function, um, which is available via the little speech bubble on the bottom left of your screen. I'll try to keep a note of these questions and we'll cover some of them at the end of the session. Please bear with us if we don't cover your question because we have a lot of you attending um, and there's only so much um, time. I'd now like to hand over to Andy Lidstone, who's a principal consultant with RISTEC, with extensive experience of risk and safety management in many industries, especially the oil and gas industry. So over to you, Andy. Oh, thank you very much, Vicky, and uh, good afternoon to all of you who've um, come along to this webinar. Um, I do hope that you'll find it interesting. Um, for, as you're probably aware, this is a uh, and not one of a, a series of uh, webinars that we've been running during the um, the recent couple of months covering a number of different areas of um, risk management, um, risk assessment, etc. Um, and all of them have been introduced by um, such a slide that gives you a brief overview of uh, the services that we offer. So hopefully, um, by, for those of you who've attended enough of these, you've uh, probably absorbed enough about uh, the services that uh, RISTEC offers, but um, if there is anything uh, specific um, about anything um, with regards to any of the services we got up there, then please um, just drop my, myself or Vicky a line at the end of this and we'd be more than happy to discuss those further. So moving on to the topic of today. Um, as I just mentioned, we've got uh, a number of the um, webinars that we've covered within this. And the first one of this series was looking at the basics of a risk management process. And I've got the, uh, the ISO 31000 framework shown in the top corner of the, the slide up there. And that was introducing the idea that to properly manage our risks, we need to have a, a good structure towards risk management, such as we know the hazards that we have, we understand where those hazards um, are coming from, how they might present, and that we can evaluate the acceptability of those risks to our business. And the, the ISO 31000 standard is a very generic uh, standard looking at all types of business risk. Um, and for, as a general principle, for all of those, um, any type of risk that we might identify that might affect us, whether it's health, safety, environment, product, um, project related security types of risks, once we've gone through the, the risk assessment process of identifying, analyze and evaluate, we're, we're left now to, to making the decisions as to what we can actually do with those risks. And by and large, there's really only four things we can do. And we can avoid a risk, we can make decide not to embrace that risk within the business. It might be that we choose not to do an activity, enter a particular business area, something like that. Um, it's very effective, it's the most effective risk control we've got, but it's also very restrictive because it stops us entering different markets. We can transfer the risk, we can give the risk to somebody else by contract, by insurance, etc. Um, but again, that will have financial costs. And what we finish up with is that for the majority of the risks that we have within a business, we're left to the, the two centre points on this diagram, that we have uh, the opportunity, the duty, if you like, in a lot of areas to be able to reduce the risks. Can we put things in place that would further reduce that risk? And once we have got to the point where we think that we can no longer further reduce a risk, we have to accept those risks within the business. We retain those risks, but we have to then make sure that the, the risks uh, remain tolerable to us. And I'll come on to this idea of tolerability later. But where a LARP comes into is in this transferring from reducing to accepting, because we have to have some basis for making a decision as to whether or not a risk is acceptable to us, that we 
would choose to retain it and some means of assessing whether or not a particular risk reduction measure that would reduce a level of risk to an acceptable level, whether or not that is acceptable and whether or not that makes sense to us. And so that alert process is looking at the movement from reduction to acceptability. So ARP is very much a safety issue. Um, the, the concept of practical risk reduction exists in a, in a lot of areas. Um, but when we're talking about ARP, primarily it has developed within the, uh, the safety side of the, of the business. It is the basis of how we manage health and safety within the United Kingdom. Um, it is something that uh, derives from a, a 1940s um, legal judgment um, in the UK, um, which has been expanded upon since that point. And it's something that has been widely adopted particularly by multinationals who want to apply a common set of uh, standards worldwide, but also in a number of other areas. Um, regulators in different countries, etc., have also adopted the same basic principles associated with it. And what we're looking at with a LARP is uh, assessing the, bat the, uh, the sacrifice, the time, the cost, the difficulty of reducing risks against the amount of risk reduction that we would uh, achieve by that. And so we're trying to evaluate that um, uh, level of remaining risk against the, um, the sacrifice necessary to get us to that point. And as I said, a lot of it arises from a, a 1940s court judgment. And there's a key um, phrase that I put up on the screen up there that came from that court judgment, which was associated with the fatality in the, the coal mining industry. And as based on that, um, that paragraph at the top up there, there's, there's a number of key steps that have um, arise from that. Um, and key in there is that um, we use the term reasonably practical. That's a, a narrower term than possible. Possible is anything that could be done. What we're looking at within a LARP is what is reasonably practicable. It also introduces the idea that we cannot, that there is no such thing as absolute safety. Um, that there is always going to be a level of risk. What we need to do is to do our best practical efforts to make sure that we have reduced that risk. And another key concept within the whole idea of a LARP is that there is a presumption of implementation, that we should be approaching a LARP with the idea of what more could I do, why have I not done it? And so we're, we introduce this idea, that's our starting point, but we also introduce a test of gross disproportion. A gross disproportion test uh, is something that will make sure that the benefit we get from risk reduction is going to be weighted um, or is worth more to us than the sacrifice uh, of achieving that level of um, that level of, of risk reduction. So there is this idea of a presumption of implementation. And the last one I want to again express within there is that we as individuals, as individual companies, businesses, uh, etc., you own the risks, therefore it is your judgment. You are the ones who have to own the alert process. You have to be the ones that make the judgment as to whether or not something is reasonably practical. And from going into and looking at the ideas behind a LARP, um, there are a number of um, what I'd like to think of it as um, fundamental steps um, or fundamental questions that we have to, to, to satisfy to allow us to, to make the judgment as to whether or not we, are, we have reduced our risk to a level that is as reasonably practicable. And a key part of this is that the more we understand, the better quality our risk assessment process is, the more we're going to understand about where the risks can come by, come from, and therefore the better quality our, um, our LARP judgments will be, because we will better understand how we might influence the risk reduction processes. So as I said, the, I tend to think of it as a, a set of key steps, hurdles, if you like, that we have to cross. And the first uh, two hurdles are, are the basic levels. We, a LARP is not 
a reason to disregard the law. You cannot use cost or sacrifice arguments to say that I am not going to apply the law. The law has to be applied. We have to have an acceptable level of risk. Again, we cannot use a LARP arguments to say we will impose an intolerable level of risk onto people. Once we've cleared that hurdle, the second hurdle we also have to clear is the idea of good practice, again, which I'll come on to, but making sure that we're aware of what is reasonably practicable within other areas of the business, within other area, similar industries. And then once we have cleared those two hurdles, then we're into the area, to my mind, we've done the bare minimum. We've got, um, we've got an acceptable level of risk. The key thing about a LARP is we have to seek to improve. We have to ask the question, is there anything more we can do? Is it reasonably practical? Is the, could I put in additional measures? They might be along the lines of improving the competency of people, putting in extra barriers, um, extra safeguards, so, uh, you know, the whole range of, of things. But to ask ourselves, what more could we do? Is it reasonably practicable to do so? So starting with the first one of those um, hurdles, if you like, the idea of legislation and risk levels, that we have to have a... Um, an acceptable level of risk before we can uh, say that we are a LARP. Now, those risk levels may be accept, um, measured in a quantitative way. We might have numerical values or it might be qualitative. And what is acceptable to us as the risk owner and what is acceptable to society, which may be set down by legislation, may be set down by public opinion, may be set down by... Um, societal judgments is going to be in most cases is set by risk levels but it equally might be um, set by the magnitude of a consequence there might be some things that are so terrible that it would not be possible for us to accept it no matter how um, infrequently it was to occur but equally there might be things that they occur very very frequently but the um of low consequence but again because of their frequency that we may set our own uh, acceptability targets in there and as part of all of this it's not just a question of saying well i've met the numbers i've, I've ticked the box on my risk matrix therefore the risks are also acceptable um we might choose to say that the risks are not acceptable because we are relying on controls we don't own or we're relying on controls that we don't think are very uh, robust that might fail so although yes we've, we've got a tick in the box that says my number is low enough um, we don't really have any belief that it's going to continue to work. So we have to have an acceptable level of risk. And typically when we're talking about acceptable levels of risk, we tend to think of it in terms of three rough, broad bands of risk. There might be the, uh, the broadly acceptable, the low level risks that um, is generally you know, it's also no we don't really have to worry about them in a lot of cases and at the top end we've got the unacceptable level of risk the level of risk that we cannot live with and from an a, a industrial perspective particularly from a safety point of view most of the risks live in the the central region what we can call is tolerable if a LARP. that's not to say that if a risk sits in this central part it's automatically tolerable the, the it has to be tolerable if it is the best that we can do, i.e. it's tolerable only if it's a LARP. And in the same way that, and when we're looking at risks, uh, I think we covered this in one of the earlier web webinars that we ran, that our judgments about risks may be qualitative based on our knowledge and experience, they may be semi-quantitative. We assess the risks via a, a risk matrix or some other decision-making tool, and that allows us to make judgments as to the frequency and the consequence. Or they may be quantitative. We may come up with numerical risk values, so the risk of a fatality to a most exposed individual. And so these are the, um, the measures by which we may accept our, um, we may choose to measure the risk by which we may choose to make our risk assessment judgments. 
And in general, the, the larger the risk, the more uncertain the level of risk, the, the more we tend to move from qualitative through to quantitative type levels of risk. But each individual risk will have its own acceptability criteria. They may be set by legislation, they may be set by our own companies. So that gets us past the first step, which I was talking about with regards to um, legislation and um, risk at having to have an acceptable risk. The second step was talking about the role of uh, good practice. Now, within UK legislation, there is a specific definition of the idea of good practice, which is um, in part shown up there. But what? But as a general principle, outside of the UK, the idea of good practice uh, applies to everywhere. To allows us what and the idea behind good practice is that what industry over time has identified as being good practice what we have identified as being uh, the the standards necessary to control risks um, allows us to build upon the experience of others such that we're not uh, constrained by our own knowledge and experience we can build upon what um, standards have been developed by others that help us have a better understanding of what things uh, are reasonably practicable. And as it indicates down in the, in the bottom corner of that slide, that um, the guidance we work with within the United Kingdom is that compliance with relevant good practice alone may be su sufficient to prove that we are a lot because what is contained within good practice has whether or not it's come out of um, ISO, whether it's come out of ANSI or ASME or other standard setting bodies, what is contained within there re represents what people over time have said that is reasonably practicable. However, this does not remove from us the obligation to seek to improve, to ask ourselves to what more we can do. So this then takes us into the idea of a LARP. So for LARP, we need to have a, reason, a good, robust procedure. We've got to have, the better we look at things, the better we approach um, assuring ourselves that we are a LARP, the easier it is for us to defend ourselves, the easier it is for us to assure ourselves we have made the correct decision. So the basic steps to look at what we have, to ask ourselves, could we do anything better? Are there any potential risk reduction measures? Could we make what we've got better? Could we put additional controls in place? To look at those things and to then compare the benefit and the sacrifice. There's no one size fits all. In general, the more complex the risk assessment, the sorry, the more complex the situation, the more complex the alarm decision making process will be. Um, and the, the idea being that as the duty holder, we have to have something that allows ourselves to say, yes, we fully understood the risk and we have done something that is suitable and sufficient to evaluate whether or not something is reasonably practicable at that point. So key considerations within this alarm process, we need to consider all the risks that we're responsible for. Um, we own the risks, they exist within our processes, therefore we have to make sure that they are managed effectively. We need to consider the effects to our personnel and also the, the effects that might affect other people off the site. Similarly, if we are exposed to uh, risks that come from outside, for example, a neighbouring industrial facility, then we can't prevent those um, risks, but we have an obligation to make sure we look after our personnel as best as is reasonably practical. So we have to consider, can we manage those? Can we do anything better? What would be the, the, the sacrifices? What would be the benefits to doing that? Um, in terms of benefits, then generally speaking, from a safety point of view, we're looking at reduction in risks to harm, or sorry, the reduction in harm, whether or not those are injuries, fatalities to the workers, and if we're dealing with um, potential risks that could go off site, reduction in risks, reduction in harm to members of the public. On the other side of the equation, the sacrifice side, then typically we're looking at the money, time, trouble 
associated with implementing that particular risk reduction measure. So it might be the cost of design, the, the cost of implementation, the cost of purchase, shutdown effects um, to implement an additional risk reduction measure may, may, may make the, the process slower, uh, our industrial process slower at that point, in which case, again, then that is a sacrifice that we have incurred in there. Important to be to, to make sure though and to remember this idea of a presumption of implementation and also to make sure that we are being reasonable about the, uh, the sacrifices that we believe would be entailed at that point. There may also be dis, uh, what I could call as disbenefits, new hazards that are introduced uh, by a putting in place one particular risk reduction measure. We might say, well, we could protect our personnel by giving them fully enclosed suits. Well, that might make them might make them uh, safer with regards to one particular hazard, but might also introduce other hazards associated with heat exhaustion or clumsiness or something like that. So that might again might be part of the the sacrifice at that point. Once we've we considered the potential risk reduction measures, we consider the benefits and the sacrifice, we have to compare the two. And when that comparison, then this is where we come into the idea of gross disproportion. Gross disproportion is a concept that comes out of the, the judgment I was talking about earlier. It's not explicitly defined, it applies whether or not we are doing our judgments qualitatively or numerically, but it's, a, if you like, a, a weighting factor that is applied to the benefits such that all of the benefit we get are a great, of greater value to us than the sacrifice that we would incur at that point. Um, that might be a judgment call. We, uh, we could say that uh, you know, the idea of wearing a fully enclosed suit to protect against a very uh, benign substance is completely impracticable. It's grossly disproportionate to the benefit we get. Or it may be a numerical judgment. Numerical judgments, typically we would be talking in something like the, the range of um, 1 to 10, but um, we'll touch on that in cost-benefit analysis. But in general, the, the bigger um, the potential consequence, uh, then the greater the disproportion that we apply to it. The more we are risk-averse, the more it is worth to us to uh, put in place the risk reduction measure uh, to achieve to make sure that we are a LARP at that point. So we, we have to then start asking ourselves, well, what is, how do we make that decision? How do we um, assess the, the benefit and the sacrifice side of the equation? And I mentioned to you that in terms of assessing risks, we may choose, um, do it from a qualitative, a semi-quantitative or a quantitative value. And similarly, when we're making the alert judgment, it works in exactly the same way. So we can make a qualitative, qualitative uh, alert judgment. Does it make sense to us? Do I, based on my knowledge, experience, do I think that this is a reasonably practicable risk reduction measure? Yes or no? We may choose to do it as a semi-quantitative approach. Um, this is very widely used. So we use a simple matrix to at least ask people, well, you said we could do this risk reduction measure, well, what would be the sacrifice, high, medium or low? What would be the benefit, high, medium or low? And to, to get people to justify their decision-making processes at that point, and to have the discussions about, to, about why we think something, uh, whether or not it is a LARP or not. If these don't give us enough granularity to help us make a reasonable decision, then we can use cost-benefit analysis as well. Um, cost-benefit analysis allows us to reduce everything to a numerical value. Um, so we are comparing, coming up with numerical values of um, the amount of harm that we've re avoided and a numerical value of the sacrifice uh, entailed at that point. Um, a lot cost-benefit analysis does not make the decision for us. It is just an input into our decision-making process. Uh, too many times people just rely on cost-benefit analysis as a very black and white decision-making tool that makes the decision for them. It's not supposed to be that. It's supposed to be an aid 
to the decision making process. And as it says on the, the slide there, a sensitivity analysis is always going to be required. You're making estimates of the amount of harm that will be reduced, you're making estimates of the sacrifices that will be entailed. We have to uh, change the numbers, use slightly different numbers, and to see whether or not we make exactly the same decision at that point. And within, if we get, I do resort to cost benefit analysis, then, you know, some of the, uh, the things that would be in there so that the costs, as I said, time, trouble, difficulty, installation, maining, maintenance, shutdown and installation, all of those are allowable costs. The benefits is going to be the reduction in harm. Now, this means then that we have to have some means of measuring um, the numerical value, the monetary value of the amount of harm that we reduce. Um, a very common, uh, common method, certainly within the United Kingdom, is the, uh, the idea of value of preventing a fatality. Um, and so this is defined as the, the value achieved of re a, achieving a certain level of reduction in risk of death. Um, there are, we can also measure it in terms of uh, reduction in injuries. This is not saying how much we value a life as. It is making sure, that giving us a numerical value for how much harm we are avoiding, how much we would pay to avoid a certain level of harm. Originally in the United Kingdom, we uh, estimated this is about a million pounds. This was in 2001. Um, that's generally been uh, revised upwards over time. You can see up there now that it's about uh, 1.6 million pounds on the last figures that I've quoted there. Again, that is not the same as how much we value a life. Um, but it allows us to have what you would like, if you like, a subjective measure of, um, sorry, an objective measure of, of um, the risk reduction. So that's been a very quick run through. We only have half an hour for all of these, but um, to summarize the, the basic process, we need to understand the risks. We need to have done our risk assessment. We need to understand uh, the scenarios. We need to understand how we are uh, managing that risk and to, to question those controls. What am I doing to, to manage this risk? And then once we know the controls and we've questioned how good we think they are, are there enough? Do we have an acceptable level of risk? Will those controls continue to work? Could I improve upon those? Could I improve those controls? Could I add more controls in place? Is that reasonably practicable? What are the sacrifices? What are the benefits? How much do we allow for gross disproportion? And to make a judgment, we have to make those judgments. We own the risks, it's our adjustments to make. And to then implement those things in good time. The risk does not actually reduce until we put those, those risk reduction measures in place. And to document that process such that we are making judgments during the, um, the could we do more and is it reasonably practical stage, we'll make judgments. We, if we do this, we think we will get this amount of risk reduction benefit. We might put a control in place and find that when we actually do it, it just doesn't work in the field. It's, it's not as good as we thought it, it was going to be. At which point, if we have a, a well-documented process, then we can come back to it and say, well, okay, the first thing we tried didn't work. Can we try the second thing? Can we try something else? And to, to then allow that to build upon it, for others to build it, to learn from it. And as a side benefit, if you like, if things were to go wrong at some point in the future, to allow us to be able to demonstrate to persons, yes, we considered this and our judgment at that time with the best information that we had was that we would decided to implement this and not to implement this. And this is why we did those things. The better we documented, the better uh, we can assure ourselves that we have made the correct decision. Key points with the whole idea of alarms that we have to do the basics. We have to meet the legal requirements. You cannot use a LARP to, um, to not do mandatory things. We have to have an, an acceptable level of risk. We have to consider the role of good practice and to try to meet that. Good practice we can deviate from, 
but we have to have a detailed justification as to why we have deviated from it, that we have to have something that is going to allow to ourselves to be in the position of being able to say, yes, we are doing something different than good practice, but this is why we think it provides us the same or better level of risk control at that point. Once we've got past those two steps, then to say, could we do anything better? Does it make sense? What are the sacrifices? What are the benefits associated with that? We have to consider all of our reasonably foreseeable risks, but, uh, the risks that we control and also the risks that might affect us. And that there is the basic process of uh, a LARP of looking for improvements and evaluating those improvements applies to all risks. But in the same way that our risk assessment processes um, are going to be proportional to the level of risk, then the processes, the, uh, the methods we use to help us make our LARP judgments should again be proportional to the level of risk so that we can go through judgment, we can uh, structured review techniques or numerical um, review techniques to help us make those decisions at that point and to record those things and then to learn upon it from that in the future. So that was a very, very quick uh, run through on the basic principles of a LARP. Um, I hope we managed to cover all of the main points um, to you, but uh, now would be a, a good point, place for anybody to, to ask any questions. Vicky. Great, thanks Andy. Um, yeah, so if you've got any questions about a LARP that you'd like to um, ask Andy during this call, please, please IM them, as I said earlier. Uh, we do have a couple of questions that have come in. Um, so, first of all, John is asking, Andy, what do you think about well-reasoned argument, WRA, acting as a bridge between the legal requirements and the technical analyses in the LARP process? Um, I'm fully in favour of it. I have a great fear of just pe of um, decisions about risk being given off to um, if, if you like safety specialists to make to make that decision. There should be a logical presentation of all of the considerations, how things are actually managed, um, a consideration of the standards, the environments that we are working within, et cetera, et cetera, um, to present a level of, um, if you like, the argument as to why we believe that our risks are being managed to a level that is a LARP. Um, I'm fully in favour of the ideas of well-reasoned arguments. Great, thank you. Um, Chijioki is asking, is there any correlation between residual risk and justifying a LARP? Um, in the sense, yes, there is, because it, residual risk is the, the amount of risk that you retain within your organisation once the controls have been put in place. Um, any risk reduction measure is then going to be applied to that level of residual risk. So the lower the residual risk that we have um, in place at our facility, our site, etc., um, the less benefit we are going to get from putting in place our risk reduction measures. So if we have a very, very low residual risk, then we may find ourselves in the position of not it not being practical to implement any further risk reduction measures because the the risk reduction side of the, the equation is going to be so minor at that point. Um, a facility that has a high level of, in, of um, residual risk may find that it has um, to put in place more risk reduction measures because the benefit it is going to get from those is going to be higher. Okay, and I think following on from that a little bit, um, Danielle is asking, would you be able to run us through a practical example of a process wherever you analyse the residual risk and try to determine if that has to be managed to a LARP or not? Um, I'm not sure within, necessarily within the, the time scale we've got right, uh, yes. for this webinar. Um, I'm more than happy to, to chat through with, uh, with Danielle later if she wanted to, but I mean, the basic process 
is always going to be you have to as you have to understand the risks to start with so we have to have gone through the risk assessment process such that we know how much risk we have to start with we look at the controls that we are relying on to manage that level of risk that leads us to then the residual risk that may be judgmental it may be numerical and then the alarm process um, the bigger the level of risk, the more comprehensive the alert process would have to be. Um, and then, so that alert process would then apply to that residual risk. And for those risk reduction measures, we take away our benefit from that residual risk to, uh, if you like, the, the delta risk, the, the, the delta risk benefit that we would get, and that we compare against the sacrifice. Okay, well, I hope that's okay, Danielle. If you look at the contact details on the next slide, um, then get in touch with us, and we'll and we'll see if we can if we can help you out further with that. Um, Syed is asking: Does the proportionality factor change from location to location? For example, from an offshore location to an onshore one. Um, within the guidance that's issued within the United Kingdom, yes. Um, um, primarily in be comparing onshore and offshore, um, onshore uh, you are you have the potential that your risks may affect members of the public, who are um, and therefore they will the members of the public tend to have a lot lower tolerance for being affected by um, industrial hazards than members of the workforce because members of the workforce are more aware of it, they are more uh, in control of it, if you like. Um, for the offshore industries, we have very little um, uh, involvement with the public at that point, so they tend not to be associated um, with the uh, the accidents, and therefore there would be possibly a uh, a lower level of uh, disproportion associated with the offshore industries. But that's a very very simplistic argument because um, offshore you may be. Um, potential that your accidents may affect the environment, which is a publicly available thing, whereas um, a onshore environment in a very desolate um, place away from the public may be a slightly more acceptable, uh, in inverted commas, um, level of risk at that point. So yes, disproportion factors, they may vary between different sites, different countries, uh, certainly. Um, but I, I think in my ex experience that, particularly if you were talking about transnational companies, transnational companies try to have a common approach towards um, acceptability criteria to make sure that you know one, uh, what's not acceptable in one country is not acceptable in another country. Great, thank you, Andy. I think we'll make this the last question, so we'll wrap up with this one, but I think it's a good one. Um, Trax is asking, how to convince top management that our decision is proper? The value of life is not enough. It's common that company owners are unhappy when they need to pay for extra safeguards. We can show them cost-benefit analysis, but this should not be used as a decision-making tool. I, I agree with you. I mean, yes, cost-benefit analysis is an input, not the decision making at that point. Um, I try not to be flippant at this point, but actually getting senior management to sign on to the decision um, is a reasonable starting point. I so that there is something that says I X managing director of this company accept full responsibility for these decisions um, and the implementation of these decisions. Um, that is, I know it sounds flippant, it's not trying to be flippant, but um, there has to be ownership of it. I know I used the phrase an awful lot as we were going through this, but you know, companies have to be responsible for those risks. Um, companies have to be responsible for the judgments that they make as to the acceptability of the risks and the judgments that they make as to the acceptability of um, whether or not they are going to do further measures. Um, the more that we can get ownership of that process, the more responsibilities we have at that time. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Andy. Okay. Um, okay if you'd like to just 
So that's a little bit about me. Apologies. Uh, <laughs> it just flashed past too fast, Andy. But that's yeah, the best some, way. Here are some some of our contact details. So yeah, just to wrap up, if you if you've got any questions that you've not obviously managed to get an answer to, if you think about them later, please contact us with the inquiries email address at the top. If you'd like to know any more about our training or education, then please email me at the training email address. Um, a lot of you already know that we do a completely online MSc in risk and safety management. We've got a lot of um, continuous professional development courses and we tailor and bespoke programs and courses for all sorts of clients all over the world. Um, Robert, I can see you said you're interested in the postgraduate certificate. Please just drop me an email. That would be great. Um, and thank you very much for your attention, everybody. I um, hope you do have a safe and secure day. And as I've said, we will be sending out an email to all of you with details of how to access the recording. And thank you very much for myself as well. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.